For at least the last two centuries, scholars have studied biblical passages in minute detail, digging deep for a better understanding of the historical background, the literary structure of the narrative, and the theological ideas buried in the text. And they've produced a rich treasury of knowledge and understanding. Never before has so much been known about scripture. Yet the church didn't preserve these writings simply to provide scholars with a living. All the fascinating and frustrating texts we now call the Bible were brought together, not because Christians wanted to know more about history or literary analysis, but because these narratives were experienced as revelatory in some sense. Today we consider three different books from three different cultures set alongside each other, not because the church felt they could provide interesting information about God, but because they thought God was actually speaking through them. So what's the point of listening to these readings? Well, it's really quite simple to ask what God might be saying to the church today through these ancient words. The medieval church had a name for this process of listening. They called it Lectio Divina. It can be taken to mean many things, but perhaps it's best thought of as brooding on the text, expecting to hear God speak through these ancient words allowing the imagination to capture one aspect or another and focusing on that for a while, listening for what might be the word of God. And it's about expecting to be changed in some way. In the world of Lectio Divina, there can be no fixed meaning. God's word is dynamic, multifaceted, elusive and teasing, drawing the listener into a new world of possibilities. It's a world of spiritual transformation, which is killed stone dead by a heavy-handed moral and doctrinal handbook model of the Bible. The problem with that approach is that it's entirely predictable, because the preacher already knows what the text must mean, so there's no room left to be taken by surprise. The word of God isn't heard, only the word of the preacher. But listening to God is a playful activity. Who knows when it might lead? Perhaps it'll lead us up a blind alley, or seemingly so. Or perhaps it'll lead to some extraordinary encounter that changes everything. It's about listening on God's terms, not our own. So what might God be saying in this reading from the first two chapters of Exodus? Who knows? The trick is to listen. Not to read the text, but to listen with what can be called the spiritual senses. An intuitive openness to new and surprising possibilities. So hear the word of God. A new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He spoke to his people in alarm. There are way too many of these Israelites for us to handle. We've got to do something. Let's devise a plan to contain them, lest, if there's a war, they should join our enemies or just walk off and leave us. So they organised them into work gangs and put them to hard labour under gang foremen. They built storage cities for Pharaoh. But the harder the Egyptians worked them, the more children the Israelites had. The Egyptians got so they couldn't stand the Israelites and treated them worse than ever, crushing them with slave labour. The king of Egypt had a talk with two of the Hebrew midwives. He said, when you deliver a Hebrew woman, look at the sex of the baby. If it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. But the midwives had far too much respect for God and didn't do what the king of Egypt ordered. They let the boy babies live. The king of Egypt called in the midwives. 
Why didn't you obey my orders? You've let those babies live. The midwives answered Pharaoh, The Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They're vigorous. Before the midwife can get there, they've already had the baby. So Pharaoh issued a general order to all his people. Every boy that is born, drown him in the night, but let the girls live. Now a man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. She became pregnant and had a son. She saw there was something special about him and hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she got a little basket boat made of papyrus, waterproofed it with tar and pitch, and placed the child in it. Then she set it afloat in the reeds at the edge of the Nile. The baby's older sister found herself a vantage point a little way off and watched to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe. Her maiden strolled on the bank. She saw the basket boat floating in the reeds and sent her maid to get it. She opened it and saw the child, and her heart went out to him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrew babies. Then his sister approached her. Do you want me to go and get a nursing mother from the Hebrews so she can nurse the baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, go. The girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter told her, take this baby and nurse him for me. I'll pay you. The woman took the child and nursed him. After the child was weaned, she presented him to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses, saying, I pulled him out of the water. Where to begin? Joseph is dead. The old order has passed away. The new Pharaoh didn't know a thing about Joseph. But God's promise remains certain. The promise that Abraham would become the ancestor of countless people. In fact, God's promise in this story appears to be working rather too well. The people of Israel have become a great multitude and are starting to worry the government. Something must be done to control all these immigrants. Let's cut their benefits and work them to death. That'll solve the problem. Except it doesn't. This is God's promise and the plan doesn't work. So let's go for plan B instead. Let's develop a birth control policy that will put the lid on the population explosion and calm everything down. But this is God's promise. So plan B doesn't work either. Now for plan C. Genocide. The migrant other is so threatening that we must strike swift and hard. Kill the boys, but keep the girls. They might be useful later as slaves. Notice, if you will, the absence of God in all this planning. In fact, God doesn't get a mention until the arrival of two faithful Hebrew midwives who demonstrate, even to the heavily patriarchal world of the Old Testament, that God is perfectly capable of working through women. And as a matter of fact, in this story, it's only the women who seem to think about God at all. Women are also central to the development of the story, opposing women from opposing sides. Like many a hero in other folk tales, Moses is cast adrift in a basket on the river. Not for the first time, God's promise is hanging by a thread. But it's the women who push the story forward. Is it simply coincidence that Pharaoh's daughter happens to be passing at just the right moment? And is she deliberately setting out to contradict her powerful father? After all, she seems to know perfectly well that this is one of the Hebrew boys her father has sentenced to death. Yet she intervenes to save him. And is it a coincidence that she just happens to find a wet nurse 
who looks suspiciously like the boy's own mother. Here's a conspiracy theory, if ever one were needed. Notice how God disappears once again in this final section. Yep, God is there throughout. There would be no story without this God. No woman to rescue the drowning child. No Pharaoh even to contemplate a new immigration policy. God is utterly in control precisely through God's absence. The promise is most certain precisely when it is most uncertain. Paul knew that too. Listen to what he writes to the Christians in Rome. So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God what is good and pleasing to him. Judging from his letters, Paul spent quite a while contemplating the story of Moses. And as he brooded on scripture, he was taken by surprise. The story of Moses starts in a brave new world ruled by a pharaoh who knew not Joseph. So something new was needed to push the promise forward. Now, as Paul starts to think about it, God is doing it again. The same promise, but a dramatic new twist. That apparently is the way God prefers to work. Continuity through discontinuity. And now the story is moving again. No longer Moses, but Jesus is the one who brings freedom and hope. And as, and as Israel had to readjust at Sinai to one new twist, so the church has to adjust to another. Things must change. It's time to stop conforming to established expectations and time to be transformed into something new. Meeting God in Christ is not meant to mean more of the same. It's meant to change things. It's meant to prompt action. As Peter is about to discover in this reading from the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus went into the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi, where he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Some say John the Baptist, they answered. Others say Elijah, while others say Jeremiah or some other prophet. What about you, he asked them. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus, for this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock foundation I will build my church, and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. At last, the penny drops and Peter's starting to get it. You are the Christ the agent of the reign of God, who will change our myopic view of reality. 
that she knew dear old Peter as an extraordinary habit of only ever opening his mouth to put his foot in it. And this, we are told, is the rock on which the church is to be built. So no change there, then. Or is there? As Peter stumbles towards this new encounter with God in Christ, he's privileged to witness the transfiguration. The moment when this rock on which the church is built sees the glory of God transforming the very mortal and ordinary body of Jesus. But of course he misunderstands the purpose of this encounter. He wants to stay on the mountain and build shelters. But the purpose isn't to build churches and contemplate the divine, but to come down off the mountain, inspired and energised by the divine presence to change the world. The transfiguration is about the glory of God breaking through into this secular world. The call is to heal, to cast out devils, to challenge the powers that be. Do you know we're back to Pharaoh? Immigration, genocide, gender relationships and watching God at work in the hidden manoeuvres of the so-called real world. So what's the point of these readings? Simply to listen to what God might be saying to the church today. Amen.